Um, we're going to be talking about service meshes. To begin with, we're just going to define microservices and service meshes. We're going to talk about an environment that we use for service meshes and, and evaluate some use cases that we highlighted and found, and then, hi and then circle back with some lessons learned. So if you hear about service meshes, you almost always hear about it within the context of microservices, that if you have a lot of microservices, you're going to need a service mesh. But could it be that you could use a service mesh without having a lot of microservices? I would argue that you probably could. But let's first look at what our understanding of microservices are. Microservices are sometimes a little bit loosely defined or ambiguously defined. Uh, but generally speaking, we accept that a microservice will communicate with another service over the network. It will usually speak HTTP, but it doesn't always have to. Usually, microservices are independently deployable. So, if you have a suite of app, if you have an application that has a, that consists of a suite of microservices, each one of those microservices may be versioned and deployed independently of each other. Usually, they're organized around capabilities. Like maybe one microservice handles logging, maybe another one talks to Facebook, maybe another one handles financial transactions, et cetera, et cetera. And they, because of this because they're independently deployed, they usually can be written in the language that the development team prefers to write that specific component in. So a microservice could be written inside of in, in C in one instance, and JavaScript or Node.js in another, and Java in yet another. And they can all work together because they're all going to speak HTTP to each other. And generally speaking, because it's called a microservice, we think of them as very small. But in the larger context, instead of like an enterprise environment, almost any, micro, almost any service looks micro in size because you're going to have many applications and many services. Um, so you could argue that microservices are very similar to services, but we generally, uh, but we generally think of microservices as slightly different. Um, a microservice, in order to stay very small, usually doesn't incorporate a lot of, how would you say, boring things, like handling authentication, maybe handling security, maybe handling rate limiting, because they are focused on just the business logic. And microservices will often have to talk to other services. So if you think of a monolithic service, it tends to try to solve everything, whereas microservices are designed with the idea that it will talk to other services. So if you're not going to be writing things like TLS, if you're not going to be writing things like rate limiting, if you're not going to be writing things like authentication, what, you're going to want to defer that to something else. And that's where a service mesh comes in. The service mesh usually will be providing a lot of these boring things that allow you to keep the microservice to be very small. But if you could imagine that if a service mesh can offer that same sort of services for a microservice, it might be able to offer that for a legacy service as well. So what is a service mesh? Good news. If you type it inside of Google, you'll get 343 million results. That sounds really promising, right? But if you look it up inside of Wikipedia, there's exactly two sentences to describe what a service mesh is. So the likelihood that you and I come up with the same idea of what a service mesh is is very unlikely, because it's not well defined. So what's my take on a service mesh? I'm glad you asked. Service meshes are principally concerned with helping people or other services consume a working service. So a service mesh could be used by us inside of a web browser, or a service mesh might be helping another, a microservice or another service connect to another service. That's what a service mesh is principally concerned, uh, concerned with. A service mesh is not about how to run a service. That's what an infrastructure provider will do whether or not that infrastructure provider is a container orchestrator like Kubernetes, or it's something inside of VMware, or inside of OpenStack, or what have you. Now, can a service mesh help and work with an infrastructure provider? Sure. You could imagine that an infrastructure provider can do scaling of a service based on like how much memory is being used and how much CPU is being used. Those are easy to understand. But a service mesh may also be able to help you understand that, hey, we suddenly have a rise of 500 errors in that service. And that while the memory and CPU may not actually be that hot, it actually may need to scale up. And so the metrics that a service mesh can provide 
may provide useful information to an infrastructure provider to make scaling decisions. So don't look at service meshes as replacing an, an infrastructure provider, but rather working with an infrastructure provider. That being said, I've given you a lot about what they are and what they're not, but let's get a little bit more specific. With, as far as like network connectivity services, you can think of service meshes as providing things like rate limiting, providing things like load balancing, can provide layer seven routing decisions. When I say layer seven routing decisions, I'm pretty much talking about HTTP. So it can look at headers, it can look at the query strings, it can look at the, the path, the URL, and it can mutate that and make decisions based on that. It can also provide service to service identity so that if there's, if a service is being, if service C is being talked to by service B, service C can know that service B and not service A. And especially in the context of say microservices where you may have many services talking to other many, uh, talking to other services who in turn talk to other services, it may be very hard for that downstream service to know that it was me, Mike, talking that originated that request. So a service mesh will often provide the original requester or principal support so that not only do we know that it's service C talking to service D, but it was Mike that originated that request. And that may be helpful. It usually can also integrate with existing identity providers. Short but sweet, if you're able to generate a JSON web token or a JWT, most service meshes can work with that and authenticate and challenge against that. If they can parse it for the service on, on the service's behalf. A service mesh will also provide security controls. It can make it so that the public section of a website is accessible by anybody, but the administrative paths of a URL are only accessible by perhaps IP addresses from the corporate network or people who have a specific JWT or what have you. It can provide information about control about ingress and egress. It can identify that this traffic originated from the corporate intranet versus the public intranet. And then handle traffic that's destined for the corporate intranet back out or traffic that's going to be handling, that's going out to the public intranet. Also, service meshes tend to provide the yucky stuff like TLS on every level. Whether or not that's TLS for uh, a, a certificate that you see inside of your web browser, or if it's TLS that's going to encrypt traffic transparently from one service to another, so that while the two services think they're talking plain text, if you were to run TCP dump over the network, they're actually encrypted, which can actually provide a higher level of protection for the environment, because if somebody's able to packet sniff for whatever reason, they're not able to understand what's going on. Service meshes also try to normalize the network. While we do have things like service discovery inside of Kubernetes, service meshes also provide uh, service discovery as well. And that can help machine, like bare metal machines and VMs be a part of a common network, just like within Kubernetes. Service meshes also tend to be able to span multiple data centers. They can span multiple clusters. And generally speaking, they can support a hybrid environment. So your environment may involve some containers being run on a machine, Main can, uh, maybe just processes running on a bare metal environment, maybe some VMs, and also maybe a Kubernetes cluster. All those can be joined into one common service mesh. Service meshes also provide observation services, the ability to get logs, regardless of what, what, where the logs are being generated from. They provide abilities to do distributed tracing. This often is very useful in, say, the microservice environment. Much like the principal requester identification that's useful, you may want to know, hey, I put in this request, and three services in, something dies. I want to see what's going on. And so distributed tracing is very useful. Uh, you can get usage metrics. We mentioned earlier that the infrastructure provider may be able to see that there's an increase in 500s and other things that's going to be provided by the service mesh. And if you're very advanced and you know about chaos engineering, service meshes can help with, uh, with chaos engineering. You can, you can program, you can con through configure, declared configuration, declare that certain, the certain customer is going to have a failure while the rest of everybody else is not going to have a failure. And that certain someone could be your test probe. And it can also provide artificial delays. So you can test your services to see, well, normally these requests only takes 30 milliseconds, 
but under certain circumstances, I want to test what happens when it takes five seconds. You can do that declaratively through a, configure, or through a service mesh. So I gave you a lot of features, but there's a common theme throughout all of them. And that is, they're kind of useful features, but they're kind of boring to write on your own. Somebody's already written it, you'd like to use it, and you don't want to have to bother writing it yourself. But also what might be happening is you might have services right now that exist that maybe do some of the things that a service mesh can do, but not all the things that a service mesh can offer. And so therefore I would argue that you can drop your service into that and start leveraging the service mesh to give you the full complement of services. Also, I think another thing that should be clear is, is that we're, we're concerned about consuming services. We're not concerned about how you run the workload or the service. So therefore, the service mesh is going to behave similarly, whether or not it's inside of a containerized environment, whether or not it's inside of a Kubernetes environment, whether or not it's inside of bare metal or virtual machines. So service meshes, I hope, you can see are being useful in both services and microservices especially in microservices. So we identified over the cloud native compute team five use cases that we think that a service mesh can help a real world scenario of an existing environment. One of them is to retrofit a legacy application to best practices. Another one is to allow microservices and services to be able to talk to each other as if they're both first class members or peers. We want to be able to see that we can have a common singular API to be able to deploy things like TLS certificates and get logs. We also want to see how it could help normalize the network, make things look a little bit more normal or more how it looks on your laptop when you're developing. And also to provide a, sim a rather simplistic, or si a simple to configure, but very powerful high availability solution. So while everything's defined, let's look at our environment. We picked Istio as a service mesh. Istio is a, is a great service mesh. It's, uh, it, it, there's other service meshes available, but it has a lot of mind share, especially within the enterprise uses. If you look at, say, OpenShift, it uses Istio under the hood to provide its service mesh. It's an open source effort. It's mostly done by Google, but it also has contributors from IBM, Lyft, Cisco, and VMware. It's used in multiple uh, machine language projects, including Kubeflow, which you heard just earlier. Uh, it's also the foundation of Knative. So if you like Knative, it's, probably, it, it's built on top of Istio. And it's heavily reliant on Envoy. What's Envoy? I'm glad you asked, because I have a slide for it. Um, Envoy is a network proxy. It is a CNCF graduated project. It was originally created by Lyft. And it's designed to be very performant. So what do you think a network proxy is? Well, essentially, it's a gatekeeper that's going to act between the rest of the world and a, and a network namespace. So in the vernacular of Kubernetes, it's within a pod. But you could imagine other scenarios. So traffic between two applications that, within, that are within the same network namespace, they talk to each other directly. But if you want to talk to that application, you have to go through Envoy. And if that application wants to talk to the outside world, it also has to go through Envoy. The effect is transparent. But because of this, you can imagine that a service mesh is nothing more than, a, than the configuration of Envoy for all the Envoys that are existing inside of that mesh. And so the control plane for a service mesh of Istio is to control and configure Envoy. Now, there's other parts of the Istio control plane but we don't have time to cover it. But just trust me, there's other interesting, cool parts of it. The other thing to clarify is this is that our environment that we tested on was both public cloud and private data center. It involved both uh, bare metal machines, virtual machines, containers running inside a virtual machine, and also uh, full-blown Kubernetes. Uh, obviously, we can't run bare metal machines inside the public cloud, but you get the idea. The point was is that we wanted a solution that could work within any environment. And we also imagined a relatively realistic enterprise network topology. We were going to make it so that there's different ingress controls on the pub from coming from the public internet versus the corporate intranet. And same thing for traffic that's emitting out of the service mesh. It, may, it will be handled differently for the corporate intranet services versus the public internet services. So let's go through the use cases. Let's retrofit a legacy application. 
A legacy application that we thought of is a regular web service that's speaking port on port 80, no encryption whatsoever, that's talking to Redis. It has no encryption whatsoever. It has no authentication controls whatsoever. It is just bare, it's just out there. And because of that, you probably don't have it, you probably don't have it on the public internet. You probably only have it attached to the corporate intranet. And if you look over there, it's speaking plain text all the way down the line. Well, with the service mesh, we can make a lot, we can improve this a lot. We can make it so that the only people that can talk to it have signed JSON web tokens. We can en enable mutual TLS that's transparent so that the traffic that's coming through from the ingress to the website and from the website to, the re to Redis is encrypted. And we can also deliver end user certificates so that when a person's looking at the browser, they're not looking at it at port 80, they're seeing it through a real TLS certificate. You can, do that with a, uh, you can do that with a service mesh, and that can help retrofit a legacy application to look more modern, at the, you know, or at least more secure. Use case two, allow services and microservices to exist together as first class members. The idea here is, this is that we have a modern web service running inside of Kubernetes, and we have a legacy web service that's running on a bare metal machine. Maybe it's five or 10 years old. It's not, it, you forgot how to even build the service anymore, but it's running and you like it. And we also have a MySQL service that's being run within the Kubernetes environment as well. Um, so you modernize Kubernetes. It's going to look something like this, where you have the Kubernetes cluster and the bare metal machine. And you're going to probably have hard-coded IPs. And of course, everything's going to be plain text. And because Kubernetes has weird ways of exposing services external to the cluster through things like node ports. While MySQL speaks at 3306 normally, you're probably going to have a weird port like 20939 because that's been assigned to it. This is kind of clunky and it looks ugly. So with a service mesh, what we can do is we can leverage service discovery. So we can make it look nice. We can have it say web service and we can also have it to say database. Because of the service mesh is going to encapsulate both the Kubernetes cluster and the, and the bare metal machine, we can actually expose out port 3306. So again, it looks natural. And as been a theme in the previous example, we can also have encryption all along the way. So therefore, while MySQL does have TLS encryption, it can be a pain to configure. Here, the service mesh administrator can enable that encryption for you. So you can speak normally, plain text, easy to debug, but under the hood, it actually is encrypted. So use case three, allow single vector for security and operations management. So as you can imagine, if you have many services, many services probably have many different ways to deliver TLS certificates. Um, if you have, say, a Tomcat instance, if you have an Apache instance, if you have maybe a Go application that has certificates built in, this can be very hard for an operations team to be able to update and maintain that. And each one of those probably have their own way of logging and getting logs. Especially, like, like you may have Kubernetes, which provides the ability to get logs out, but what about the bare metal machines? What about the virtual machines? And the firewall rules, can be very difficult. It, there's usually one way to do firewall rules on bare metal or virtual machines, and it's a completely different world within Kubernetes, especially because Kubernetes has all these different nodes and the services can land on any one of those nodes. And so therefore, you tend to become very permissive with your firewall rules. But if you leverage something like uh, Istio Service Mesh, you can do all this through the control plane. You can deliver TLS certificates. You can employ the, uh, the ability to receive the logs. And you can also fetch, um, you, can also, uh, you can also articulate the firewall rules service mesh wide. So use case four, help normalize the network. What do we mean by that? Well, what we're thinking is, say you have a service and it needs to be able to talk to the Facebook API and the Twitter API. Now, normally within an air-gapped environment, you're going to have to assign special IP addresses and special ports because you're probably going to send that through a 
uh, through a, service, a security appliance. And you also probably want to ensure that only that one service, especially inside of something like a Kubernetes cluster, which could be running multiple services, only that one service is actually being able to use that whitelisted traffic to Facebook and Twitter. So you could imagine that it looks something like this, where you have these, again, weird IP addresses and weird ports. They're talking TCP, they're talking HTTP, not HTTPS. Or if they are talking HTTPS, it's going to be with a self-signed certificate, and that's sometimes problematic. Well, with a service mesh, what we can actually do is we can actually put the TLS certificate on the egress gateway so that we can compile the application to trust our common certificate authority that the enterprise has, and it will actually think that it's talking to api.facebook.com. We can add api.facebook.com and api.twitter.com into the service catalog, so, or service registry. So that that way, even though we're not going to directly talk to the real Facebook or the real Twitter, we are able to create this rule that sends the traffic to the security appliance. And because we can have firewall rules that are attributed to specific services, we can deploy an unauthorized web service within the same environment that an authorized web service is and feel safe to know that the unauthorized web service will not be able to also talk to Facebook or Twitter. This can be very powerful. And also from all this, your environment in the, in the data center is going to resemble your environment, say, in a public cloud or inside of a, a, um, on your laptop because it's, it looks natural. So a simpler high availability solution. So you can imagine that a first web service that we create is being accessed by an end user. And because it's maybe microservices or just another service, it talks to another service that may experience downtime. But as luck would have it, you have a second cluster that has the same services deployed to it. Wouldn't it be nice if you could, without any work done by the application, be able to divert traffic to that second cluster when you're having an outage. So just some background, handling failover from one data center to another is typically hard, and you also typically have to worry about handling encryption that's going across from one data center to another because there's usually not a data center to data center VPN tunnel. And so you don't want to have to have each one of those services have to have their own configuration for how to talk to the other data center. So a little bit of a run through. We're going to deploy inside of, say, a Kubernetes cluster, but it doesn't have to be a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, Service1.foo. It's going to be Service1 within the foo namespace. And we're going to register it within the global service registry. We're going to say that there's foo, uh, Service1.foo.global within this global registry. And we're going to indicate that while this service does exist in both clusters and both meshes, you should definitely prefer the service that's running in the first ser in the local service mesh. That's great. You have some outage. That's not great. But the good thing is, is that the service mesh can see that there's an outage and intelligently route the traffic seamlessly to the other cluster. And while you may have some additional latency, you won't have an outage. And when service one dot foo comes back up in the first cluster the routing preference will be reinstated and everything will be great again. So lessons learned. Service meshes are far better for HTTP services. There's so, many, there's so much flexibility and usefulness in having deep knowledge of the HTTP protocol to be able to do things like look at headers, look at JWT tokens, and other things that just make service meshes much more powerful when you're using it within conjunction with HTTP services. That being said, failover and fault tolerance, that works with layer four as well. So if you have a TCP service, it still provides value. It still provides value to create a, a consolidated view of your network despite it being on VMs and bare metal machines and Kubernetes clusters. Come in with a plan. If you're going to create a service mesh and you want to have it span multiple data centers, you're going to need a certificate authority management profile. You're going to have to op have an operations team handle 
certificate authorities between the different service meshes. If you're going to be handling things like a hybrid environment of a Kubernetes cluster and bare metal machines, again, you're going to have to plan that out. It's not that the service mesh can't do it, but rather you want to plan it. Always plan ahead. Always plan what you want your service mesh to do, because that will help you determine what, uh, how, to, how to create it and how to maintain it. As shown before, service meshes can provide great support for legacy services without, re, without repackaging, without redeploying or rebuilding a service, we can add encryption to it, we can add rate limiting to it, we can add authentication to it, we can do many things to it and we haven't touched it at all. That's great. And that will help you comply with more modern security approaches or more, more modern techniques. It can make a legacy application fit with your modern web services until you have the time to reinvent that modern or that legacy web service. It's great for fault tolerance. And so if nothing else, service meshes are almost a must for microservices. I, I think that's obvious. But I think that the benefits extend to regular services as well. And if you take nothing else from this conversation, I hope that you're able to look at your existing services that you have deployed, look at the benefits of a service mesh, and you might actually find that it could be useful for you. Thanks. <laughs>